Welcome to Insights, the podcast of Forerunners of America, and we are here every time to warn the nation from a biblical perspective and to help you respond in faith. And today, we're looking at something that I didn't even think was on my radar like 20 years ago or so, but because it's expanding and becoming more and more a culture, we've got to address this, and we've got the right people to do it today, and that is we're addressing battling paganism, and meaning standing firm as Christians as our culture moves more and more pagan in more and more uh, blatant and even brazen ways. That's what we're covering today, uh, this whole area of paganism and how to respond in faith, how to make a difference, how to be salt and light. And with me, I want to um, uh, bring back from an earlier podcast, Chuck Hetzler. And so, Chuck, welcome once more to Insights. Thanks so much for having me, Dave. Great to be here with you. Yeah, and I, I should say it's Dr. Chuck Hetzler because you do have your PhD, and I'm also grateful for your experience in the realm we're talking about today, as well as your uh, work in um, in, the, in theology and also prayer and actually really being salt and light and believing God to move in this day and hour. So thanks again, Chuck. And now, for the first time, I'm welcoming Judah Marks to Insights. Welcome, Judah. Thank you, Brother Dave. Good to be with you today. Yeah, and Judah is a Baptist pastor in Missouri, uh, Bowling Green, Missouri, not Bowling Green, Ohio, but Bowling Green, Missouri, and he's got a story to tell, and I want to jump into this, but how did this sort of confrontation with paganism uh, arise? Sure. Well, it was uh, this past March that I got on as a new pastor here in Bowling Green, and I'm a bivocational, and so I work just south of where our church is, about 17 minutes in a little town called Silex, Missouri. And so that was really on my uh, radar as far as outreach and reaching out to the community there because I was going to be uh, be there uh, a lot. And so on the social media popped up a uh, an event entitled Witches Warlock Wizard Gathering that was going to take place uh, in this little town uh, of 200 people, and uh, kind of shocked me, and decided to do a little digging of who's behind it, um, who's putting this on, and uh, just started uncovering some uh, involvement there with the local government uh, of the little town, and uh, and so after kind of doing my homework and realizing it was one of the older women, older men, uh, women there on the board there that had a, a tarot card psychic business. And she was the one that wanted to do, do this. Um, I just really felt led to, to respond in a, a gospel, gospel way, wanting to see the Lord work. Okay, so uh, Judah, I, I just want to jump in on a couple things. One is, can you unpack that a little bit more about um, what you felt this prompting or whatever, that you're not just going to essentially go back to your church on a Sunday morning and say, hey, everybody, let's let's pray. I'm sure you did that, but but you wanted to go much further with this. And, and kind of, if you could just talk about that a little bit. And also, even though Silex is a, a tiny town, um, if I remember right, you said this thing is an, an annual event, and has it draws quite a few few people. Is that correct? So this was the very first one that uh, was planned in this town, but south of where we live, there's been uh, different witch gatherings that have uh, attracted lots and lots of people. And so trying to nip this one in the bud uh, before it gets you know, traction where it would become a yearly thing. But... Um, just past October, usually around October times, I would you know, be real intentional with doing outreaches in that month because we know it's a real heavy month for you know, the occult and paganism. And, and so this was last year we did a an outreach in the neighborhood that we lived in, just some open air preaching off the back of a, a pickup truck and passing out things to the kids. And so here was just an opportunity to uh lift up the name of Jesus during this month. And, and so we just gathered some uh, local believers, some folks from our church. Uh, I put out a video announcement, basically inviting local churches and pastors 
And um, that video ended up getting picked up by the organizer, the woman that organized it, and she shared it with all of her friends. And then that blew up from there and all kinds of just real vitriolic uh, attack with the comments and uh, kind of became a, a just somewhat of a town celebrity. So we're going to want to play a clip of that right now. Uh, I'll put, if people want to watch the whole two and a half minutes, I'll put the link in the description of this podcast. Here's the clip right now. Hey there, friends. My name is Judah. I'm pastor at Indian Creek Baptist Church in Bowling Green and wanted to invite you to come out and join me and area Christians on October 8th at 5 p.m. here in Silex, Missouri. We're going to be gathering together to uh, confront some uh, evil that is trying to come into this town. There's a witch, warlock, wizard gathering that has been uh, organized here that's going to happen right after the fall uh, festival. It's a very popular event here uh, in, in Silex every year. And what we're looking for is uh, a number of Christians to come out and uh, read some scripture. We're looking for 50 people to read a chapter of scripture during this event. Also looking for prayer warriors. If you know how to pray, we're going to be doing some prayer walking around this witch uh, warlock wizard gathering. And also there's going to be testimonies being shared of the power of God. I believe that God can save anyone. Be in prayer for this event. We believe that uh, the Church of Jesus Christ is called to be salt and light. This is the Sermon on the Mount. And so here's an opportunity for us to be just that salt and light. This is not a stone throwing, uh, angry uh, event. This is just some broken hearted believers and Christians coming together that are concerned for our community here. We know that whenever darkness and the occult and witchcraft is allowed to operate in a community, uh, nothing good comes out of that. And so we're simply going to come in boldness and in faith, believe that God is going to, to move. So after I had made that video, uh, I found out that they were going to be having an alderman's board, board meeting there in the town. And uh, I got with my church and said, we need to attend this and just really speak up and let the folks know that we're, this is not a good thing. This is not uh, going to bring a blessing uh, onto this town. And so um, I, I went with four of our church folks. And uh, whenever it was my time to talk, I just shared from Deuteronomy uh, 9, I'm sorry, 18, verse 9, where it says, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord, your God, is driving them out before you. Uh, and just basically shared with the with the with everybody that was there a call to repentance and uh, to Christ and turning from sin. And little did I know that they were going to... It was going to make the paper, the Lincoln County Journal paper. So uh, I'm assuming that at this alderman's meeting, whether it's the aldermen themselves or it's just people in the crowd, a lot of these people are not Christians and they're not Bible-believing people. How how did they respond? And also, if you can just share a little bit, like, uh, if they're not already warm to the ideas of the Bible or Christianity, how come you chose this this tact of being very— uh, direct. Well, it was just a small handful of people that were there, uh, the mayor and the, the folks. But I, the reason that I wanted to be direct is just because of the seriousness of the of the nature of what was going on, and uh, it was touted as a just a harmless um, costume party, uh, and. We know the the devil's a liar, and it basically 
got a lot of people thinking, oh, this is no big deal. Even one of the other older women that was a believer came to me afterwards and said, yeah, I did, had no idea. Uh, I would have never voted this in if I knew. What a great example of being salt and light. This woman says, if I had known, and that's what Christians are called to do. We're called to be salt and light. Like you, you again, going back to your, your church situation there where you're a pastor, sure, you can alert people and ask them to pray, but you had to be on the spot sharing this truth so that somebody like that comes forth and says, wow, I never knew this. And I've seen this happen, of course, with Christians because they're not informed about whatever, but um. Non-Christians, I think sometimes we just dismiss non-Christians as they're not going to make the right choice. Well, if we inform them, sometimes even non-Christians, the light bulb goes on and we're being salt and light in the culture. Amen. And ultimately, it's just the urgency of the hour for me, you know, and I, I don't want to regret um, being uh, cowardly or not speaking out, speaking up in times like this. And so... So, yeah, just the night came, and we had a, a good small turnout of folks that came and uh, had a pastor who came up from Texas to uh, do praise and worship. Uh, we were given uh, the field right across from the the event. Uh, originally, was just planning on just surrounding the sidewalk, right, kind of right on top of the event. But they said, here, we'll give you this field. So we were about 500 feet or so, and so we... Uh, got a trailer and a generator and a PA system and just did church, you know, outside, praise and worship and uh, prayed, lifted up the name of Jesus. There was about six different uh, preachers that came out uh, and for about a six hour period from 5 p.m. to 11, just uh, of an open air revival service. And, and one of the blessings that uh, throughout the time was just uh, the response, the prayer response. Uh, once it, it got known and uh, numerous pastors and Christians just contacting me saying, there's a lot of people that are praying for you this night. We had our association uh, lead. He came and prayed. Um, and, and, and it just, I think, got a lot of folks' attention. And it was a very polarizing, you know, there were folks that were absolutely raging against you know, how dare you, you know, infringe upon the rights of, uh, of them to do their thing. And, um, and then even in the Christian world, there was uh, some pushback uh, with a, a pastor that you know, just was not, didn't want his people going. And, uh, but in the end, we just there was a number of folks that came. There were some teenage girls that came and sat down uh, and found out that one of the girls' dads I had ministered to uh, years ago in a county jail. And uh, uh, one of the women from the witch gathering, she came over and had a lengthy conversation with a pastor friend from Texas. And she said, yeah, I'm never going to forget this night. And and just the the prayer support too of the folks that did come. It was just a real, uh, very clear light and dark. Uh, there was you really had to choose sides, you know, that night. And and I just was encouraged. And and coming back out of that, uh, just that sense of Lord, we did what you called us to do, and we're going to leave the the. the the harvest and the, the results up to you. Judah, what would you say to somebody who says, you know what you did, it really causes more harm than good. I, I, I hear a lot of um, Christians kind of saying, you know, the way that we can best win people over is just kind of by being, you know, really nice and affirming to them and not being too controversial. The being too controversial just pushes them away even further from the faith. What would you say to somebody like that? Well, I, as over the years have seen just the impact of just going and taking that bold stand. And um, my picture is a Titanic going down and there are people that are going to perish. And if I'm not going to go, I'm not, I'm not going to go out here and, and say, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, wondering, uh, no, I'm going to, Hey, it, you're going to die if you don't get, 
you know, help, you need to get in these lifeboats. And it's going to be a little shocking. It's going to be a little uh, maybe uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, you know, there's going to be some people saved because I believe in a God who is still saving people and he can still save witches too. You know, he's a good God and more powerful than that. And oftentimes you'll ask, okay, so what would you, what would you do? Uh, what, what, so how are you reaching the lost? You know, what, how are you preaching the gospel? And uh, oftentimes you get crickets, you know, they're, they're not, they're not going out and sharing the gospel. So I kind of like my way better, you know, than, than your way. Right. As uh, D.L. Moody said the same thing about, I prefer my way of preaching the gospel over yours, which yours is not to do it at all. Okay. So Judah, um, I just want to just uh, go a little bit further here before we kind of open this up for a discussion on paganism slash the occult, because uh, clearly witchcraft has uh, the underpinnings of the occult that you just read in Deuteronomy 18. And I want to kind of clarify this and talk about being salt and light in the culture and maybe, Chuck, what you have seen in this area as well. But uh, but Judah, just anything else related to this whole situation with Silex or, or any um, fruit from it or takeaways or, or something like that as you look back on the event? Well. After the the meeting there, and uh, we had just a lot of flurry of um, internet stuff and the back and forth, just with the comments, I was uh, had no idea that it would get blown up as big as it did. But uh, um, one of the opportunities that you know, I have in town was to be able to go into the nursing home to do some nursing home ministry. And um, a number of the town residents, you know, that were kind of against it and just didn't. Um, having that other ministry now that's continuing to go on every week, um, just being that a light there. So this wasn't just a come in blow up and come out this is you know i'm vested here in this community i love these people i love these families and uh and a lot of the the youth um one kind of funny story that happened after th that next night one of the uh, kids at the school that i work at uh he said hey mr judah i i really enjoyed your speech last night uh i could hear it from my house and uh so the just the sound and the gospel it it really broadcasted a long ways in this little town and um my ultimate prayer is that the lord would just route out the just this stronghold and that multiple people over time you know would just come to come to christ get born again and uh and so we're going to keep keep laboring and going to keep fighting. Good word. And, you know, God is calling us to uh, stand up for righteousness for him in many, many ways, personally in relationships and bigger gatherings like the one you just described. But he's calling us to stand up for righteousness. And I think one of the now messages for the church right now is that means that if you're standing up for righteousness, that you will, by default, be fighting against wickedness. And I want to be careful here. It's not that we hate any of these people. I love what you put in your um, your uh, video, Judah, where you were talking about promoting the event itself that we just showed the clip of, but that you said in there that you believe that Jesus can save anyone. And this is part of standing up. And, and if, if God can save these people, these people need to know there's an alternative. In, in your case, the alternative was directly across the street from the uh, witch warlock uh, uh, darkness gathering um, right there. And, and, and that's powerful that you show people there's a, there's, there's a truth here. There's an alternative here. Uh, think about this as you're also checking out the dark side, and uh, and that is, uh, I think, a profound part of being salt and light. And, and just simply in terms of the culture, if Christians say nothing, it could be this or a hundred other topics, but if we say nothing, we're A, not being salt and light, but we're also not doing what I would call pre-evangelism. You've got to be talking about the issues, the issues that we're all uh, 
confronting every day in our culture so that there is a the God can work in hearts so that there's this this conscience that we're God is using us as Christians to prick the conscience of the lost so that they even begin to think about do I need to leave my current uh, uh, behaviors, values, lifestyles, etc. And this is all part of the gospel. It's all being part of being more fruitful. This is not a side issue. The, 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 the public uh, um, uh, advancement of righteousness in contrast to wickedness is actually part of the gospel. Yeah. Well, I think what you were just talking about, Dave, is so important and something that is missing from a lot of Christian ministers, really, our outlook on what our job responsibility is. Um, and and even um, the title of this podcast, this particular one that you set up, Battling Paganism, I think that too many Christian ministers don't see themselves as somebody who's supposed to be battling anything. I think they see themselves as, um, you know, hey, I'm just supposed to take care of my flock and just, um, you know, tend to the sheep over here that God's given me charge of in my church. And and if I am engaged in the community, well, I really want everybody to just kind of consider me, you know, the really nice guy that they can go to if they have a problem or something like that. Not somebody to rock the boat and certainly not somebody to battle against different things in the in the culture, in the city, in the society where one lives. So I think that this whole notion goes back to a sense of uh, a wrong sense of what Christian leadership, Christian ministry should look like. And, and that's not just for the, the primary leaders, the vocational Christian ministers. It's, it's for all of us. We're all called to let our light shine and to, um, to, to be the salt of the earth. And so I think this is, a, it, this is so necessary. And in terms of where this can go, I mean, we see the degradation of our culture all around us. We see secularism in increasing. But as you're pointing out here, it's not just secularism where there's just pulling God out of society. There are all kind of these other ways of considering the spiritual realm and, um, and different ways of even synchro synchronism where you bring parts of God and parts of Christianity and parts of the Bible into the way that we think and the way that we act. And so, um, you know, I think Christians know and see what kind of situation that we're in in terms of Christianity's declining. Um, but we have to do something about it. We've got to go on the offensive. We've been used to being in the majority, and we have to realize that uh, things are changing. And if we're not going to do anything about it, then who is? And how do we expect things are just going to change? Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, we all want change. Right. You know, we do see, uh, we do see paganism slash the occult seeping into so many areas in, in Judy did, Judah did you want to comment yeah I, I just got this this sense of we have a, a commission from our king we have everything that we need right for life and godliness uh, we uh, I approach things like this you know with a want to have a childlike faith you know, we are filled with the spirit right if we're baptized with the holy spirit and fire let's go and i i don't want to look back and say man i should have or i i wish i would have and I just get this call this urgency of now's the time for pastors like you said brother chuck if it's not us who's going to do it where are the Dietrich Bonhoeffers? Where are the, the guys that are willing to, to go and just say, hey, I know this is going to be unpopular, but I'm willing because I love my king. I love, I love the Lord, and I want his name to be glorified. And, uh, and then just trust him. Trust that he will do what he does best, saving, saving people. So, Dave, I want to introduce maybe a controversial idea here, if I can. And that is that um, I think you see paganism creeping into our culture in even ways that a lot of people don't realize. And um, again, maybe some of those who are watching or listening uh, may not fully agree with what I'm about to propose, but something that's very common for a lot of people and Christians included to take part in is yoga. It's one of the most popular forms of exercising, stretching, that kind of thing. And now the word yoga means yoke, and it and all the uh, poses 
of yoga, or at least the majority, uh, if not all, are some sort of posture of worship to specific foreign gods, to specific idols of Eastern religion. And uh, it may seem like, well, this is just a harmless thing, and I'm just doing this for exercise, and I'm not, you know, worshiping from my heart something. But yet, there's a spiritual world that's tied to all these sorts of things. And many people are unaware of um, when we step outside of allegiance and under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we expose ourselves to a lot of things, and we allow for the spiritual world to be opened up to the kingdom of darkness more and more as we partic- participate in these ways that we feel like, well, it's just harmless. Just like Judah's saying with this witch gathering, oh, well, it's really just a costume party. It's really harmless. You know, don't worry about it. There's a spiritual world connected to all these things, and it's infiltrating more and more in the most subtle ways, which is the way that the enemy likes to do it, right? He comes as an angel of light. Um, and uh, and so we got to be on our guard, and and not on our guard only, but as, as you're saying here in this podcast, commendably so, that we should be on the advancement against these kinds of things, pushing them back. So at the heart of paganism is a belief in the supernatural, and so that's why you have uh, witches and warlocks in, in the example that, that Judah gave, um, because they do believe in the supernatural, but just kind of pulling back a bit, we've got uh, paganism where you're trying to do things, whether um, it's rituals or some sort of sacrifice, and I don't necessarily mean human sacrifice, it could just be sacrificing chickens or whatever it is, but the, they'd have sacrifice to cajole the spirits to get on their side. Like, we're going to do this to please uh, please those spirits, so now the spirits will protect me from whatever it is. And, it, and it, this would be at the heart of paganism. And I remember, um, actually, one of my neighbors in, a, in one of the, the locations where my family lived, um, they actually put empty glass pop bottles um, or soda bottles, put them on the bushes around their house. And these people come came from a, a Christian background, but they because they said that if you put these empty bottles, that that will keep the spirits going into those those uh, uh, bottles versus coming into the house. And we see something uh, throughout history somewhat connected to this with gargoyles, you know, these strange creatures that are outside of large buildings and cities and so forth. And the idea is that, that those uh, often they look like some sort of hideous lion or some sort of creature that's half monster, half uh, animal or half human or something like that. And and they're they're there to scare the the evil spirits, keep the evil spirits out, and therefore then we won't uh, have to have various uh, struggles or, or or problems in our life. And so anyway, we've got this thing going on um, that that I see more and more coming into culture. I do see a connection with Halloween every year. The the more uh, contemporary versions of Halloween are clearly, if there is a spirit world and there's um, um, angels and God and so forth, and, uh, and by the way, this is very biblical, that there's a, a spirit world of, of good and evil, and the evil would be the demonic um, and all this kind of stuff going on. Well, we are um, we are going to be uh, uh, unwittingly often inviting in the dark spirits. When I when I mentioned Halloween a minute ago, it clearly it celebrates everything that's on the dark side, and so even that is a, like a cultural intrusion mm-hmm. of paganism that often we're not thinking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right, um, Dave. That that there are people Christians uh, now. I'm thinking about who do bring these things into their lives without really thinking that, hey, this is a violation of, uh, of what I say and what I believe about God. God's our protector, right? He's the one who protects us from evil spirits. We don't have to put these soda bottles around, um, and we don't have to put these gargoyles out here. But I think people don't really think through the fact that, you know, with like the Lord said, hey, we're either serving him or we're serving money or we're serving another God. It's it's either idols or it's the living God. You know, it's one or the other. And so we have to put that into practice in every area of our lives. And if we're kind of following some other, you know, ritual or spiritual worldview or system in some aspect of our life, even if it seems harmless, even if we still go to church, even if we still read our Bibles, we're really being divided in our lordship and commitment to Christ. It's it's a dangerous thing. And one thing I'd say, too, is that sometimes people don't even think about it um, and, and realize that some things do have a spiritual connection. For instance, um, I, I've had instances where people have 
realize that they're having demonic influence or they're allowing demonic, demonic influence into their lives or their families or their homes because of having certain artifacts, certain um, physical things like, um, uh, uh, what do you call that? <laughs> the Native American, like, um, darn, I can't remember. Oh, dream catcher. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Dream catcher. Yes. That those can be um, things that where again, like there's a, there's a, a worldview behind that. There's a spiritual realm behind that because there's a whole other religion, a non-Christian way of thinking and, and looking at the world that's behind that. And those those elements in and of themselves can have an attachment to the spiritual world. And Christians sometimes just don't know about these things. I don't know how many years now that we've been dealing with you know, the first since the first Harry Potter, right? That came out. And just that celebration and coming in like a flood, where it's getting all of these children uh, interested in that world. I mean, we're talking as a lot of years, a lot of millions of books, and not just that. I, uh, I struggle sometimes when you when you start this the syncretism and the coming in with all of this stuff in the homes, right? Like you're saying, brother Chuck. At what point are we going to you know, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness that Paul says, but expose them? And it's just that, do I love the Lord or not? Am I going to just get really serious about serving him and wanting him and hungering after holiness and not wanting anything to do? I don't want to risk allowing any kind of spirit or unclean thing to attach or come in to my family. And uh, I just, I want to be on the safe side, right? And so can we repent of that stuff? Could we just, man, get it be done once and for all? And both repent of that, anything that's creeping in, in, in within the church, as Chuck just highlighted a few minutes ago with yoga, but there's all these other things as well. Um, I do think we need to give a second look at how we are uh, celebrating Halloween and why we're celebrating Halloween and these kinds of, uh, of things. Can we just repent of anything that could be an area of compromise to actually contrast the culture? And I believe in terms of getting the gospel out, that when you contrast the culture, you're way more attractive, and I would even add to that, not only attractive to non-Christians, but also the power and presence of the living God is with you in, as you're contrasting the culture. And people, mm -hmm. I, I believe more people come to Christ, more people get interested when you have this kind of a posture, rather than trying to do this syncretism that, that's been coming up here in our conversation, and, and just trying to, uh, I don't know, play in all these different arenas. And, you know, I think one thing we've got to be mindful of here is when Peter says uh, in in First Peter that that uh, that the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. This is a fundamental reason why this is so important that we're addressing this within our churches right now because paganism and the occult are rising um, in America um, and have been for a long time. But also, as God gives opportunity that we speak the truth in public situations, it might not be exactly what you had there, uh, Judah, but um, but it could be in a, in a, in a in a team of people, even where we work, or it could be with friends, neighbors, etc., that, you know, when you follow these things, it doesn't turn out well. And the enemy, he is looking to devour. And that's one thing I appreciate, Judah, about you making the stand that you did in Silex, Missouri, is that if we just lay over and don't say anything, that emboldens, emboldens the enemy to even uh, like a lion to devour more people, and it begins probably in some small ways, but in the end, these people are are losing uh, for sure their spiritual lives, but ultimately their, their lives themselves to the enemy. And that's why this this is so vital that we are actually contending for the faith, that we're battling against paganism, and and again, first of all, making sure that we're thinking clearly on this within the church. So, in other words, battling it within the church and shoring up that community, and then going out from there. Yeah, Dave, and I think that the same thing is true, is that when we do stand up, that it emboldens other Christians to stand up to and to speak out to. Like you said, when we when we hold back, it emboldens the other side. But if, if we'll step forward, other Christians will get bolder as well. Although one thing I would want us to remember is that, like Judah said, and like we see so often in the scriptures and other, way, um, other times in church history, 
that when God's people become become more bold and they speak out against um, different issues like this, uh, one of the groups of people that will push back against us the most will actually be other Christians, either whether they're Christians in name only or whether they are still true believers, but just misled in some of these ways. So it's good for us to be armed and equipped that we'll not only be called names by the non-Christians, we might be even more attacked by others who are in the body of Christ, or at least, again, um, are, are name the name of Christ. So as we kind of begin to land the plane here on this podcast, I just want to highlight that um, that there's some really real significant scriptural examples and connections here that we want to be mindful of as we are trying to make a difference. Again, first within our church being in complete alignment with God and our our Christian friends and so forth and families, but then as we uh, are salt and light in the culture. And and one clear example would be in Paul in in, uh, Acts chapter 19, where uh, he is preaching Christ, and that's one thing I love about you, Judah. You're always preaching Christ. I don't, I don't want to pass over what you said near the outset of our discussion here today, and that is that you took the opportunity to do some street preaching on different occasions. I, amen. That we're preaching Christ, as Paul did that in Acts 19. The uh, idol sales, like physical idols, the 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 merchandise wasn't selling. Uh, like it was supposed to, and there mm-hmm. becomes a riot within the city that as we stand up for Christ, there are going to be real-world implications. And what did Paul do? He kept standing. Mm-hmm. That's what we were running into just in the town. There was a, a witchcraft shop uh, that was you know, selling the Ouija boards and the altars and the things, and that was one of the vendors at the event and just the crossover with another a pro-abortion event that was happening in town with uh, some of the same people that were at this witch gathering were at that. And it just you just start seeing the the tentacles, the fingers, how they there's so much crossover once you start like we read there, the sacrificing children and just all connected. And um I just we have to take the freedom that we have in this country to still preach and be outspoken like this. I can't do this. We can't do this in a North Korea or, uh, or in Iran. You know, I would be a dead man. Uh, I, we wouldn't be having this today. And I, so I don't want to waste this freedom that we have to be able to go, to be able to, to be bold. And uh, for our kids' sake, I want my kids, when they get older, to, they know that their daddy was was one to go and to be bold for Jesus. And my prayer is that they'll be bold when they get older too. Awesome. So we want to uh, we want to land the plane here, responding in faith. And with that said, that's just huge in terms of responding faith. How will our kids and grandkids uh, remember us? And I want them to remember me too as well, uh, Judah. My my kids, and someday if God blesses with grandkids. I want them to remember that, hey, dad or grandpa, that he stepped out in faith. He actually put feet to his belief, and the words that he said was true. I knew they were true because of how he lived, and boldness, sacrifice, risk, all of that is part of the Christian life. You can't get away from it anywhere in the Bible, but especially in the New Testament. It is. Pick up your cross and live fully for Christ, and if it ends up being that you give your life, that's the point of carrying a cross, that's the instrument of death, you do it anyway. And I believe, like you're saying, Judah, there's so many victories we can have right now in the interim if we'll only step out in faith, because even though America has headed down this other path away from God, we still have freedoms, and we can still uh, share the gospel, we can still stand up for truth in a, on a hundred different topics, amen. And so, Chuck, share something with us, Chuck. I know that you're a practical guy, too, and you want to step out in faith. Share something here as we close. Well, one of the things I think about is a word that you mentioned, Dave, which is boldness. And uh, the boldness is the most common trait of the Spirit's filling of a person in the book of Acts. And so if we feel like we're not bold, it's not because we don't have that personality makeup. It's because somehow the Spirit of God is being stifled inside of us. What are we doing 
Uh, what's in our lives that is displeasing to the Lord? What's in our lives that we need to remove because it's offensive to the Spirit? And He's not working in us to His full degree, to His full power. And so uh, that's one of the things that I think about taking away from this, responding in, in faith is like, Lord, if I'm not being bold, forgive me, I repent, and show me what I need to do so that your spirit is working in and through me as he should, which which should be that I can't contain uh, what the, the truth of God and the truth of his ways and love for people that they would know and know the Lord and come to him. So um, would, would the spirit of God fill us and embolden us, uh, all of us here on this call, everybody who's listening, everybody who calls on Jesus is Lord. And Judah, any final word? Uh, just thankful that uh, the Lord is still moving to do- today, still serving today, uh, or we're still able to serve Him today in this area. I didn't able to, wasn't able to share one other good praise report that came out of it was that that journal, uh, the newspaper, made it into the homes of somewhere around twelve thousand homes with a very clear gospel call to repentance and Jesus. And, and to Christ. Amen. And so uh, praying that the Lord would continue to do his work, raise up laborers, raise up young men that'll get out there and, and just give their all for Jesus. Awesome. And just in closing, uh, you have been an example to us, uh, and I appreciate this so much because this just happened in October of 2022, mm-hmm. and I'm just so grateful you've been a modern-day example of so much of what we see in Scripture where people had to stand up. Of course, there's uh, uh, the showdown at Mount Carmel with Elijah and the prophets, uh, just awesome examples, and that you've lived this out more recently, Judah, is is amazing. And, and again, uh Paul in Acts 19, definitely worth uh, reading and digesting and saying, well, what does this this mean for us? But so many other examples, too. D- Daniel and Daniel's friends standing up, doing the right thing. Amen. And I really have a heart for what we talked about today here with the, with the paganism and, and the, uh, the occult aspects as well that are kind of all mixed together here. Um, but that this is if we do not stand up as the body of Christ and become the light in this area for the rest of the nation, this too will grow and expand and become yet another reason for God to judge America. And this is part of that realm as well that we want to do be doing the right thing uh, before the living God, whether we experience a, a revival, a, a judgment in our nation, both, whatever it is. Um, and I'm also hoping for the return of Christ, by the way. But whatever is in the future, we want to be doing the will of God bold in faith. So thanks, both of you guys, for making this so clear today, so helpful. And thank you, everyone, for joining us here on Insights. I look forward to being with you next time. Mm-hmm.